Hey friends, welcome back to the Sanctuary Podcast. I'm Robin, I'm here with Kevin again, and we're excited to bring you new content today on new stuff. The dating stuff is done. <laughs> For now. <laughs> For now. We'll, we'll, it'll probably come back up later. I'm sure. But uh, yeah, hope you guys have enjoyed those podcasts. I know we had fun uh, creating mm. them. Thank you so much for the helpful feedback and comments and texts and emails and other things that you've sent us, just saying how it's spoken to you. We're really touched by that and we're thankful for it. So we're hoping that today will help continue a conversation that will be applicable to your life where you are right now. And really what I wanted to do, Kevin, was bring up something that you were talking about uh, a couple of Sundays ago. We had snow this past Sunday. Yeah. And the Super Bowl, but mainly snow. We couldn't have sanctuary. Welcome to New England. It's awesome. It's been dumping snow this month. It doesn't look like it's going to stop. I love it. <laughs> okay. Like, I don't mind. Like, if it's just cold, I don't want it. I agree. But if there's snow, mm. winter is, oh, I don't know. It might even edge out fall just slightly. Fall's my favorite season. But when there's a lot of snow, winter is so good. I, I love being up north. Like some people are like, oh, man, I just want to be like in Southern California where it's warm all the time. And I'm like, Southern California is cool. Yep. Got great friends there. But I'm like, I love the change of season and the snow. And mm. I need this. So anyway, we didn't have sanctuary. if it's going to be freezing, it might as well look pretty. Mm. So uh, oh, I love I'm like I love how the trees are like coated in snow. Mm. You know what I mean? Totally. And just everything, it, it's like things are more silent as well when you go outside. It, it just feels like you're in a giant snow globe. It's true. And the problem with New Englanders is for a month leading up to Christmas, we sing songs about the winter wonderland <laughs> and the beauty of it and, right, you know, <laughs> let it snow, let it snow. Then January comes and we actually get snow and everyone's like, I hate this stuff. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so two weeks ago, though. Yeah. You gave a great intro message into what we're doing as a church right now, being like Jesus Challenge. Mm. And you gave an awesome intro just on being like Jesus comes from being with Jesus. Right. And you went into great ideas about uh, the Jewish discipleship method, yep. the rabbi disciple relationship, um, the yoke of the rabbi. Uh, if you haven't already, please go back and listen to that message. It it was so helpful for me. Mm. So thank you for giving it. Yeah, you did a absolutely. great job. Thanks, man. I would love it if you can dive more into the yoke of a rabbi. Explain yeah. it more for us. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I've uh, um, having an understanding of the times that Jesus lived in and did ministry and, and taught in, and his disciples in the early church from a Jewish perspective has totally changed my perspective of scripture and my relationship with Jesus. Um, I'm so thankful for friends that have um, that are Jewish uh, messianic believers. They believe they're Jewish by birth, um, mm. um, but have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is not just Jesus the Christ, they, that he's Yeshua HaMashiach, that he was the long awaited yep. for Messiah. That that's helped me. So I've had good friends like guys like uh, my friends Matt Rudolph. I'll give a shout out to Matt Rudolph, Lawrence Hirsch, and a guy named Shane Willard, who um, have expanded my understanding of that. Um, not just from a historical sense, but for me, from a relational sense, to realize that Jesus was is the Messiah, but he was also a Jewish rabbi working in a specific time and a place, um, and his disciples had a, a context that we don't understand as 21st century Western American, Northeastern, tri-state area people, uh, <laughs> you know, break that down even more. Yeah. Um, but when we get that perspective, how much more rich scriptures become to us and understanding and what that means for us to be like Jesus. And so uh, the yoke of a rabbi, that was the uh, a rabbi's interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, including the Talmud, but we don't need to get into that today. Um, so it was, and a rabbi would only be able to teach that yoke, his interpretation of it. But he, most rabbis, 99% of them, were uh, rabbis without authority. That means that they could only teach what their rabbi taught them. And their rabbi could only teach what their rabbi taught them. So you're really getting one interpretation 
of the scriptures passed down from rabbi to rabbi to disciple to rabbi to disciple and so on. Jesus comes in and gives a whole new understanding of the scriptures, a whole new in that yoke that he carried, that yoke that he passed on, that he also says, it's really interesting in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, he says to his disciples, those who have been with him, right? He, that he's been rabbi and he's been teaching mm -hmm. the whole time for three and a half years, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Make more disciples. This is a process here. And then he says, teaching them everything I've commanded you. So Jesus is saying the basically the same thing. Teach them everything I've taught you. Don't teach just your own perspective on the scriptures. I've given you God's interpretation of everything he's written. Hmm. Not only in the scriptures, but for life, because they lived together. The discipleship model wasn't you just went to school. Jesus wasn't giving lectures from two to four on Monday, Tuesday, and Fridays, <laughs> right? Um, and they, you know, the disciples are taking notes on that sure. stuff. Not that that's bad, right? But he, when he said, "Come follow me as a disciple," he's saying, "Come be with me, come live with me, come do life with me," and everything was teaching. Um, so Jesus, you know, it wasn't just uh, on the mountainside. It wasn't just, you know, uh, the mountainside discourse. It wasn't just the Beatitudes. That was uh, his teaching. But Jesus with his disciples is teaching 24-7. His life was the model of the interpretation of all of God's word. He was the living expression. He was the living interpretation. And so everything a disciple did was to watch his rabbi to watch the rabbi and to see not only what they taught, but how their life taught what they believed and lived. And so that's a totally different thing. So when we're talking about being like Jesus, it, it's wow. the same thing. That's where Jesus in John 15 says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Right. Abide, Abide in, in me, you. remain in me, and I'll remain in you. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. And so it, it it's... It's beyond, there is this uh, really cool impartation that takes place when you're with Jesus, but it's also, he's giving the same invitation. He goes, you've been with me for three years. Hopefully you're addicted to my presence. And he's getting Oof. ready to leave and he's going, stay with me. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit so you can still remain in me. You can abide in me 24-7 just as you have been. Even when you guys are going to be scattered, you still all get to do life with me because I'll be in you. Remain in me. Like, this is the lifestyle I've modeled. Let it continue. Continue to be my disciple as you make disciples. And it just, to me, there's so much in there, but it, it goes to show, and we talked about this yesterday, we can talk about this, that it wasn't like they went to church <laughs> to hear from their rabbi once a once a week, they did life together with their rabbi. Everything they did was about drawing close and understanding the heart of God. Hmm. That's super good. Um, you you also mentioned how Jesus had a different yoke than other yokes from the leading rabbis yeah. at the time. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? And then we'll go into the next segment of this podcast. Yeah. So during Jesus' time, again, like if you were a rabbi with authority, which most of them weren't, uh, a rabbi with authority could teach his own yoke, his own interpretation of the scriptures. In Jesus' time, there were two main schools, rabbinical schools, rabbi schools, uh, a guy named Hillel and a guy named Shammai. Um, that had been dead for a while, but they had set up schools to teach yep. Hillel's yoke. And Shammai's yoke. Guys with authority. Yeah. One had a more conservative view of the Torah. Right. The other had a more liberal view of it. Exactly. And even when the experts, those who had trained under them, would come to Jesus, they'd ask them questions. And if you understood Hillel's teaching, yoke, and Shammai's, often they were teaching on the thing. They were asking questions on the things that those two guys or those two teachings or those two tribes and camps disagreed about. <laughs> so they asked him questions about divorce because right. Hillel's perspective was different than Shammai's. Yep. They asked him about all that stuff. Uh, and they were always trying to trap Jesus because they knew his yoke was different and they wanted to see if they could trip him up. Or they wanted to say, hey, so which cool. camp are you in? Are you in the right. you know, Hillel camp or are you in the Shammai camp? You know, because he would teach something very different than those two guys did, or at least the heart of what they yeah. taught. And that's why the people flocked to Jesus 
because he wasn't exclusive. He wasn't saying, hey, you, you've got to be in this camp or that camp. He's he, And he's teaching the masses of people something different than they've ever heard before with the heart. And that's why Jesus... Disciples are like, man, you hold the very words of life. Or he, when he goes to mm. Capernaum and he teaches in the the, uh, the synagogue there, they're like, whoa, what is this teaching? Yeah. Where is it? Where is he getting this stuff right. from? Right. Because we've never heard it before presented in this way. And it was shocking. It was refreshing. And it was scandalous. And ultimately, the fact that Jesus turned that whole system on its head got him killed. Yeah. You were quoting some of the things that he was saying yesterday. Oh, to the Pharisees. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, the guys who maintained this system. Right. Um, and he's like, yeah, you guys will cross land and sea to win a convert. And when you do, you make them twice the son of hell as you are. I know. Jesus was so bold. Ouch. <laughs> you know. Talk about a slap in the exactly. face. Exactly. So uh, anyways, uh, <laughs> but yet his kindness in his heart was so different, you know, to go to a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, and have a religious conversation. And then he says, hey, I'm the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for, uh, the one you know, we've all been waiting for, but I'm him. But, you know, you've been waiting for me on a personal level like you don't understand um, mm. and and has that kind heart. You know, the woman caught in adultery, um, you know, both Hillel and Shammai, the yoke would have been stoner. Yeah. And Jesus is like, I I'm not going to reject the word of God that I wrote. <laughs> but the heart of it is we all sin. And so grace needs to be... Uh, uh, involved in this whole process and hmm. yeah it was just um but i don't know if that's where you're going with that but that understanding no, of it's good that yoke was that your rabbi's interpretation that living expression of the heart of god expressed in the word lived out an everyday life yeah and you mentioned how it was different i mean jesus said how it was easy and light yeah, like, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. When right. you understand, it's not just talking about it. he's not he's using the yoke is a metaphor for the oxen um, partnered together to carry the load and the burden of things. And he talks about the Pharisees; their yoke was crushing. Yep, uh, it was so hard to live, impossible to do. Right. And Jesus is going, come to me. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's my interpretation of the heart of God and the Word of God. I don't reduce it. I don't water it down. I don't. Um, I don't neglect sin, like issues or anything like that, because he never did. But he goes. But I also bring love and grace, kindness and mercy into it, which is an easy yoke to bear. Mm. Yeah. So maybe what we can talk about now is what are some things that would have been under that uh, easy and light yoke of Jesus, the the easy yoke, the light burden that his disciples would have gotten just by doing life with him yeah that I, that maybe we can make some observations that we're missing this um so the easy yoke the invisible yoke in our mm -hmm. culture right now um maybe that's what we'll call this podcast the easy invisible yoke yeah <laughs> yeah and i um i i think even um little phrases that had huge implications. Hmm. So Jesus' disciples come to him and say, hey, would you teach us how to pray? You're our rabbi. You teach us everything mm. about life. Will you teach us how to pray? John, who was also a rabbi, right? he teaches his disciples how to pray. Will you teach us how to pray? And he goes, okay, first of all, hey, when you pray, don't make a big show of it like the Pharisees do. Go into your closet. Make it about you and God. You're not trying to impress anybody, which, by the way, the the disciples who were fishermen and tax collectors and the every, they didn't, they weren't going to probably impress too many people with their <laughs> prayers anyway. So, I, they, you know, but Jesus is going, hey, don't even try to do that. Like, yeah. first of all, the Pharisees are impressive, but they're impressing they're, nobody. They're yeah. not impressing my father. Oof. Um, so get into your closet. What impresses, what's really important to my dad is if you take time to get alone when no one's seeing you and express your heart to my father. Yeah. Second thing is, so, so he, he gives that teaching. He goes, hey, when you fast, make it about me and you. Don't make it about the show. But then he goes, and hey, when you pray, say, our father. Those two words, at least in English, two words. Um, you know, when you pray, our father, Abba. He, he's using it, you know, we've, we've talked about this a lot. He's using an intimate term of father 
to child relationship. When you talk, when you pray, you're not talking to some far off uh, mighty king of the universe, which he is, but he's also your dad. So start from that posture. That would have been an incredibly powerful and scandalous expression to start his teaching by going, when you talk to God Almighty, <laughs> when you talk to Yahweh, yeah, you know, who if you see your face will melt and you'll die, right? <laughs> like if you touch his, you know, <laughs> you know, Graham Cook says, uh, don't put God in a box. He only put himself in a box and he said, if you touch it, I'll kill you. You know, <laughs> 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 you love that, right? So they have this incredible reverent awe of God. And Jesus wasn't trying to reduce the awe, the yeah. awesomeness right. of his father. But he's saying, but when you talk to him, you can come to almighty God and say, dad, my dad, daddy, mm -hmm. Abba. Even that, that teaching on a relational connection with almighty God was revolutionary. Uh, for mm. Jesus listeners um that uh that just that's such a powerful like we can't we've been around it for so long for 2000 years we say the lord's prayer all the time you know even someone who doesn't really know god probably knows parts of the lord's prayer because they've heard it but starting with our father what a different perspective that would have been that's just one example the other fact that jesus brought his yoke to the rejects, the outcasts, yep. the uneducated, the poor, the those without pedigree, power, or profile, or prestige. And he's like, you follow me. I want you guys to be my disciples. That was that was a teaching of the heart of God, the yoke of God um, in itself. Hmm. Um, you know, that he went to those who would have never been chosen as disciples, never <laughs> made it as um, uh, a rabbi's, you know, apostles to be the sent ones to represent, you know, because a disciple represented the rabbi too. You know, no rabbi would have picked Peter. No rabbi would have picked Matthew, who was a tax collector. No way. They probably wouldn't even associate with them or talk to them. And Jesus is going to like, hey, when I set up my disciples, I'm going to pick no the ones no one wants. That was scandalous. That's That was the living expression of the yoke of God um, right there. Hmm. No, and that I think that I've just received so much hope from things like that personally. Like, I get to work in a church now, but like, you, you know, I didn't I didn't come from a ministry family. Mm. You know, when people I, I, like I just relate to that, where it's like I didn't come from this. You know, my grandpa's grandpa. Like, and not not to knock people who it's like their great 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 grandfather was a preacher and. Sure. So forth. It's like I came from Dave the tree guy mm. and Priscilla the Portuguese immigrant. Like yeah. that and I get to pastor here. I mean my well, my mom was born in the US, but like, you know, grew up in a Portuguese immigrant family. Um who, you know, they ended up finding the Lord and having a personal relationship with him. And it just gave me so much hope too of like, wait, I don't need this like long legacy like you still pick my parents and chose me and mm. and like i can do this even though i don't have this you know expansive pastoral and super deep christian root background um and i i think just maybe some other things to mention like one of the things that the early disciples would have got that um, I think that we're missing today is that um, everything we do is spiritual. Yeah. Now, what I don't mean is everything we do is serious. Right. Because most people, when they hear everything we do is spiritual, like, oh, well, I got a fun go away. I'm yeah, going to put on this totally. like serious face. My like, church face. Yeah, I'm going to put on my church face. And that's not what I mean. That, which is huge, because even Jesus, when he taught about praying, he goes, hey, when you're fasting, 
don't look all gloom and doom. Mm. Don't try to put a show on of I'm all serious. Like he's like, hey, take yeah. a shower, dude. Look like normal. <laughs> take like, a live, shower. You know, live great life advice from Jesus. Yeah, exactly. That's hey, right. We need to get that word out to uh, thrive a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Rob's take a shower. About our middle school students, <laughs> like you, be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Take a shower. Take a shower. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Take a shower this week. Um, no, but you're right. Uh, well, everything spiritual doesn't always equate seriousness. Yes. Well, and so in doing research, preparing for this podcast, if you look at the Old Testament, mm. which is the Bible that Jesus used, yep. Genesis to Malachi, look up spiritual, doesn't come up once mm. because in the Jewish mindset, everything was spiritual. Right. Like I, I was able to read through um, the Bible once already this year. I, I did this crazy 30 day shred with our prayer team and I'm doing it again right now with friends from out of state. Mm. So it's like insane. And so I've read Leviticus twice this year already. Wow. Like, oh That's my good. gosh. But I'm like, Leviticus, Leviticus is slapped is, in the middle of the Torah. Yeah, right. Right, which I, I is call teaching. that the, the lima beans of scripture. Like it's really healthy and good for you, but man, sometimes it, it's not an easy swallow. Yeah, but you read it and, and you have things in there where it's like, well, okay, it, it will talk about uh, how to sacrifice an animal. If you're poor, what type of animal mm. you sacrifice? Um, it will talk about the Day of Atonement. It will right. talk about... Um, Kind of close laws, to where laws of justice and mercy. Yeah. Um, but then you have other things in there that's like, hey, if you have a rash, this is a type of ointment to use. If you get mold in your kitchen, this is what you should do. And you're like, why? Like, why is this in the Bible? Like, isn't the Bible supposed to be this sacred spiritual book? Mm. And it's as if God is saying these things actually matter. Like, totally. not, not not like the way that we go about getting mold out of our kitchen or like what ointment we use. But again, the Jewish mindset was everything we do is spiritual. I was talking with you a moment ago, just saying uh, one of the things I heard in research for this was that Christian makes a great noun and a terrible adjective. Mm. Dive into that one. Um, okay. So you can be, um, you don't need to say I'm a Christian barista. You can be a barista and the way that you go about your work and the way that you recognize, hey, I'm helping that initial calling of go and rule and subdue the earth mm. that was given in Genesis 1, that me making a really good cup of coffee is me doing that. Yeah. You know, and and because sometimes like w what I mean by that as well is we think that to be a good Christian or to have a calling to ministry, you need to be working in the church. Mm. And that's not the case. Or like, uh, I need to, I need to make, so there, there's two extremes, right? There's the um, extreme of, I'll come to church, I'll take notes, and me being a Christian is categorized in my Sunday box. Like I'll come right. take notes, but yep. you know, you you leave the church and- it's part of my life. It's part of my life. right? but it's not my life mm. and you leave church and then you go through the rest of your week and it's like you if you're in business you run business just like everybody else mm. if you uh are a parent you parent just like everybody else we just had a series on relationships if you're dating you date just like everybody else right. uh if you're single you're single just like everybody else uh and there's like almost this, okay, so what I do on Sunday in church is spiritual and important, but the rest of it, like the 95% of the rest of my life doesn't matter all that much. And, you know, I look at things like Leviticus and God's saying, hey, you know, every moment of your life matters mm. and everything that you do should be done unto the Lord. But then there's this other extreme yeah, where it's like, okay, um, if I'm going to be like, I can't just be, uh, I'll use my dad as an example. You can't just be a tree guy. I'm a Christian tree guy. Well, mm -hmm. what does that even mean? Like, you, you, like, a tree can't be Christian. The way that you pruned a tree, like, that's not a Christian pruned tree. But there was a Christian who pruned that mm -hmm. tree. Mm -hmm. There was a Christian who um, 
was able to, I mean, talk about garden work, like a like garden of Eden work, like you, you are helping, like my dad is helping make the world a more beautiful place mm. or he is helping families be safer by right. removing things right. that should not be there. That like, like that's kingdom work as well. Right. So all that to say, um, uh, let me, let me, let me go back to the Bible for a second because spiritual is used in the New Testament. Paul uses it, mm. but when he uses it, the word spiritual means animated by the Holy Spirit, mm. you know? So like if you were to go to Paul or one of the first disciples or even Jesus and ask them about, you know, their spiritual life, they would just be like, you mean my life? Mm. Like, <laughs> right. um, like, cause everything they did was spiritual. And Paul, although he was this not only prominent author of the New Testament, but also uh, an apostle, he was also a tent maker. Yeah. And he didn't see that work as a hindrance to his ministry. He saw it as a vital part of the ministry he was called right. to do here on earth. So I think that, actually, I know that Jesus' early disciples, the Hebrew mindset, was we've received the initial calling from Genesis 1 to mm. go and rule and subdue the earth. Right. Which is awesome. Have dominion. Take have dominion. dominion. Yeah. Again, not exploit. No. Big difference. Yeah. But have dominion. Be little kings and queens. Right. And then Jesus brings up this second calling in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations. Right. So what I'm trying to say is, hey, if you're a barista go and make an amazing cup of coffee, win awards. Yeah. Win awards. And at the same time, like maybe, like, because the other thing too is when we talk about kingdom work and bringing the kingdom of heaven here on earth as is in heaven, as Jesus talks about in that prayer. Yeah. Um, often what we think is, okay, I need to evangelize anytime I speak. And it's like, hey, if you have that passion, awesome. Like, tap you on the back. Like, great. But there's also like, hey, just the, the way that you're living and doing life, I pray that people in your workplace will recognize that there's something different about you. Because of, you know, to take this, let's tie it all back to the beginning of thing. Being like Jesus starts from being with Jesus, being discipled by Jesus, so that yeah, I'm not a Christian barista as far as adjective, but I am modeling my discipleship, my walking with Jesus. So it's not only I make a cup of coffee for Jesus, I'm doing it with him. Yeah. I don't leave him at church. I don't leave him in my quiet, you know, my quiet time. Um, I'm constantly with him. He's with me. And so learning to do life with Jesus and for Jesus in serving our world makes a huge difference. So that when we don't just make a good cup of coffee, I'm a good employee. I'm a good coworker. Not just good. There's a lot of good people out there, but I'm doing it with Jesus and for Jesus and like Jesus. Like you said, that that we're making disciples because we are people are going to become like us if they're around us. And if we're around Jesus, you know, they're going to have an encounter with Jesus through us, which is um, and that's the hope and prayer. Absolutely. And and that's that's part of ministry calling. Ministry simply means this, service. Yeah. Right? So, like, I, we love you guys, but you don't need to ask Kevin and I, when were you called to ministry? Like, we'll ask you the same question. When were you called to ministry? Like, the moment you gave your life to Jesus. Yeah. Now, our ministry happens to be inside a church, at least right now. Um, but, hey, I, I was just talking with you a moment ago. Man, I, I just, you know, I left the church office yesterday. I found more favor bringing ministry, if you will, out to what I was doing after work, where there were a bunch of people who don't know Jesus yet, but mm -hmm. are getting to know Hannah and I better. And we were just like, whoa, the Lord put a lot of favor on that conversation. Right. And people were interested in mine and Hannah's life, just from where we're going right from work to after work. Um, so anyway, I, I wanted to bring that up because I think that sometimes we we think that being a disciple of Jesus means like we got to leave everything yeah. we're doing and go and become a pastor, priest in the church. And just to, I know we're a little bit over time, but just to wrap up that thinking, because 
Again, this is like a history mm. piece that some people might want to check out of, but I thought was really interesting. So the Hebrew mindset of everything is spiritual started to fade when the church became more Gentile based than Jewish based. Mm. And that's not a bad thing. Like the whole point was right. to bring the message of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Right. That was the goal to begin with. But as the Gentiles became to become the primary background mindset of the church, there was this Platonic dualistic thinking from mm. Plato, that's mm. the root there. And especially as it expanded to Corinth and Roman Athens, the hometown of right. Plato, right. where there is this now dualistic, sacred versus secular thinking mm -hmm. that started to creep into the church. And life is segregated. It's compartmentalized. It's compartmentalized. And it was, God never intended it to be that right. way. And that continued to grow and evolve into a more destructive snowball. You know, a thousand years later, it hit its match in the Middle Ages, where the only time that calling was used was for priests in a church. Mm. So, this huge initial call that God gave us as people to go and rule and subdue the earth, have dominion over it. And for Jesus to say, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven was now, you know, like this huge dream, this like, you, you can't swim to the bottom mm. type vision now became condensed to a hundred people on a Sunday singing in a church. Mm. And it was never supposed to be that way. And then there was this group of people, this small resistance, the rebellion uprising, mm. you know, this like scrappy little revolution called the reformers came. Mm -hmm. And they went and th they had the audacity to read the scripture where it was talking to believers and saying, yeah. you are a royal priesthood. Right. And they're saying this to people as there are priests all across Europe but they're turning around to believers who are not in a priestly vocation. They're turning to believers and saying, guess what? You're a royal priesthood. So you are a barista and you're a priest. You are an IT guy and you're a priest. You're an arborist and you're a priest. Right. Like it, like this is, this is who you are now. A and anyway, I think that is just, I, I just want people to know today that whatever work you're doing, mm. whatever God has placed in your hand right now, right. don't become callous to the holy things that God has placed before you. Mm. Whatever work you have. And, and you might be here thinking like, Rob, like I'm answering emails and fixing Excel spreadsheets. Really like you're telling me that that's holy work. And I say, if it's unto the Lord, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I, I think even just the fact that Christians should decide never to cut corners, it, like e even just something as basic and simple as that, like go the stupid, long, harder way, but the one that's going to glorify God more, that that will bring glory to the name of the Lord, where now the Christian adjective, like when we think of Christian music or Christian art or like whatever that even means, but typically where our mind goes is like, Oh my gosh, like cheesy t-shirts in a Christian bookstore, mm. like bad cinema. <laughs> yeah. It's getting better. Yeah, absolutely. It's getting better, but like cheesy cinema, you know, and it's like there were people who you like we used to be on the cutting edge of art and architecture. And like I'm even thinking of the cathedral, Notre Dame, something that was built over generations. Mm. And there were artists and sculptors and architects that came together and they they even recognized, I, I was reading this, there are places in the cathedral that no man has ever seen, like corners in the ceiling that are now covered up by stone where there's artwork in it. And the artist's thinking was, man might not ever see this, but God does. Yeah. Yeah. Because the work that I do, right. anything and everything that I do, man, even if man never sees it, God sees what I'm doing right now. The work that I have in front of me is spiritual. Yeah. You know, so it, it just completely changed my mindset. It was a kick in the pants that I needed. So it, it, everything he did was with him and for him. Yes. So just to wrap this up right now, 
being like Jesus comes from being with Jesus. Yeah. In the work that you're going about today, whether it's fixing an Excel spreadsheet or making some really good latte art, mm. or if it's working as an engineer, or if it is doing finance or accounting or roadside assistance, whatever you're doing, saying, I'm going to work with Jesus today. Yeah. Jesus is on the job with me today. Mm. Like, let that be, let, like, let's, let's have that as the activation point mm. for today. I want to challenge each of you listening to this podcast right now to say, I'm going to work with Jesus today. Yeah, that's good. Wherever I'm going, Jesus is in the office with me. Jesus is in my cubicle right now. Jesus is in this coffee shop with my laptop right now. Yeah. Jesus is where I am. So I want to be like Jesus, but Jesus is with me mm. in what I'm doing. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Hey, can I just release a blessing? Please. That uh, we're yeah. like significantly over. No, they're good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I bless you. Whoever's listening or watching this, I bless you to know that Jesus loves you. He chooses you. He has called you to be his disciple, which isn't just a position. It's a lifestyle of relationship and connection wherever we go with whatever we do. I bless you to know uh, your uh, your Savior's yoke of teaching in every area of life to live life for him and with him and through him by the power of his spirit. Uh, may we go and be his disciples, modeling Jesus, making disciples everywhere we go for his glory. Bless you guys. Have an amazing week. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.